This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of PHM from Pittsburgh. I am still your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici. Uh, I am a MedPeach trained pediatric hospitalist at Children's UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Although we are not at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, we are still here at the PHM National Conference in sunny and very hot Orlando, Florida. And we are here with a special session today. Uh, if you have been here or not, uh, the there was talk yesterday that really got a lot of people in the room, standing room only, and the speakers were kind enough to come join us. And now before I do that, I'm going to just let you remind you all this is not a CME episode, so if you're looking for CME, please pick another episode. But this talk is going to be informative. Nonetheless, it's going to be great. Uh, the description of the talk or the title of the talk is Procalcitonin, What Is It Good For? And I'm joined uh, by the speakers. I'm going to introduce them, and then they'll, they'll introduce themselves as well. And we'll get going. So we have Dr. Brittany Slagle uh, from Arkansas Children's Hospital. We have Dr. Rebecca Cantu from uh, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And we have Dr. Sarah Sanders uh, from Arkansas Children's Hospital. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And if you wouldn't mind going around and just uh, introducing yourselves. Hi, this is Brittany Slagle. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and a hospitalist at the Arkansas Children's Hospital. Hey, I'm Sarah Sanders. I am a pediatric hospitalist at Arkansas Children's Hospital as well. Hi, I'm Rebecca Cantu. I'm also a hospitalist at Arkansas Children's Hospital. I'm also the section chief and the fellowship director. Well, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. I know you have other things you want to be doing uh, in general, but thank you. So um, I'm going to leave it to uh, you all. Uh, please tell us what you talked about, what brought everybody in the room, and we'll talk and ask questions and have a fun time with it. All right. Um, yeah, so we were doing our talk on procalcitonin. Uh, it's pretty much a high-level overview of the literature that's out there right now, and I think it's a pretty hot topic just because nobody really knows what to do with it. Um, so we're hoping to shed some light on that. I started with some pathophysiology. Uh, procalcitonin is produced in the thyroid in healthy individuals um, in the C cells. And normally, it's not excreted into the bloodstream from those from that natural production. It's cleaved into calcitonin before it gets there, uh, which is why we don't usually detect it in the blood in a healthy state. Um, however, in bacterial infections, that production in extra thyroid tissues actually gets upregulated, which is why we can detect it in the bloodstream. Conversely, viral infections actually increase the production of interferon gamma, which has been shown to block the production of procalcitonin, um, which is why, at least in theory, we shouldn't see high levels of procalcitonin in the bloodstream during a viral infection. I then went over uh, febrile neonates. So that's one of the groups of people that we are now using procalcitonin in. It's recommended by the new 2021 guidelines to measure it as, quote, the best inflammatory marker. <laughs> um, so out of all the research and literature that's out there on febrile neonates, the conclusions of that were procalcitonin is the most specific single marker for diagnosing invasive bacterial infections in neonates. The cutoff in most of the literature is less than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, and that gives you a really good negative predictive value. Um, and then there is still no single marker recommended for the decision to perform an LP or not, or to initiate empiric treatment or not. Now, Brittany, do you feel that there is more to learn about procalcitonin, or are you confident in its use and for febrile neonates uh, and for viral versus bacterial infections? So... For febrile neonates, I think the the data is pretty good for procalcitonin being the most specific marker to detect an invasive bacterial infection, and that's been borne out in several studies. Um, as far as viral versus bacterial, I'll say more research needs to be done. The jury's still out. 
it came up yesterday from several people in the audience, you know, that they do see high levels of procalcitonin in their viral infected patients, and those patients will get better without treatment. Now, if you all are going to get into this, I don't want to preempt anything you're going to say, but is it, as I remember, we had a talk here a couple of years ago, and it talked about community acquired pneumonia, viral versus bacterial. Am I, am I preempting things you're going to say? Well, then I'm going to stop talking. I'll let you guys go. I'm sorry. So I am going to talk a little bit about procalcitonin and community acquired pneumonia. So there have been a lot of studies on whether procal can help you distinguish reliably between bacterial and viral pneumonia. And really, it's not very reliable. So the more recent studies have shown that other things like lung ultrasound may be more reliable, but that procalcitonin, there's no one specific number that can really help tell you. So the previous study that showed 0.5 and below is more likely viral, or 0.25 especially, than 1 and above. You're saying that's kind of ha- that hasn't been verified in the literature, so really it's not as good. So a low pro- procalcitonin has been shown to be helpful in excluding typical bacterial pneumonia, but there have been a lot of different cutoffs studied, so I don't know if there's one particular number that we can count on. All the different studies kind of look at different numbers, and a lot of institutions will have a different number that they consider to be low versus high. So you may have to consider what your lab is saying is high versus what a various study says. I can see why this talk was so well attended. This is fantastic. Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll stop talking so you can get everything out. I'm sorry. No, you're, these are great questions. These are the questions we had, which is why we decided to do this talk. We, there is some good evidence that makes sense that in more severe cases of pneumonia, the procalcitonin will be higher. But as I said, there's not really great evidence that of what magical high number means t- typical bacterial pneumonia, just that it can be a good negative predictor. So if you have a very low procalcitonin, you probably don't have a typical bacterial pneumonia. And when you say more severe, are we talking like severe where it's empyema? There's clearly, it's not a question to the average clinician, is there a pneumonia? It's clear as day there's a pneumonia. Yes. And the procalcitonin will also bear that out. Exactly. And those are the kids who are more likely to have more severe courses, need ICU care. Okay. This is great. What else you got? So my part of the talk, I talked about what we know about procalcitonin and sepsis. So kind of broke that down into a few different parts. Um, so the first thing that we talked about um, was diagnosing sepsis. So was procalcitonin helpful in making that diagnosis? And there were some studies that found that it was a helpful part of the diagnosis, but it wasn't a standalone biomarker. So you can't just say high procalcitonin means that the patient is septic. There was also a good study that showed that if you combine that with CRP, then you had a more sensitive and specific biomarker combination. So that was more predictive of sepsis in those patients. Sarah, may I ask, are we talking about bacterial induced sepsis? So Yes. So when we, and this is one of the things I always had questions about, when you have a viral, let's say a viral pneumonia, uh, theoretically, the, the procalcitonin should be low, but the patient can be quite sick with the viral pneumonia in the ICU, and then I have no idea how to use the procalcitonin. Is that was, were you all talking about that as well? That, that's a great question. When when I was doing my literature search, I never found anything specifically. You know, I think if kids are looking very sick and they have sepsis and we're teasing out is this viral or is this bacterial, I don't think there was a study that said a higher low procalcitonin could tell you whether you should initiate antibiotics in those patients. So that was more much more of like a kind of use your clinical judgment on those type of things. I didn't find anything that specifically would answer that question. And IDSA guidelines specifically you should not use procalcitonin to decide whether or not to initiate impaired treatment. Yeah, our infectious disease doctors in Pittsburgh have also been very wary of procalcitonin, that it's just, they said and they believed exactly what you all have borne out in your talk, is that there's not enough evidence to say really for certain it's great to use for pneumonia. Absolutely. There was an adult study that we looked at that showed that if you tried to use procalcitonin as a standalone test to decide to initiate antibiotics, you would miss antibiotics in one in five septic patients. So they, the conclusion of that study was that it was not an appropriate um, decision maker. So Sarah, are, you, are we back to where we were before procalcitonin was ever discovered in that we're going to have patients with pneumonia on the floor and they're gonna have, there's going to be an infiltrate on chest x-ray. And we know, based on biostatistics, that probably it's a virus. But because there's no good ways to tell, we'll end up having to decide what is the better part of valor. I, I think so. <laughs> I was so excited about Procalcitone <laughs> as a tool to help with this, but we're just not there. Okay, what else do you guys have? 
Perfect. So the next thing that we looked at is um, for sepsis and escalating antibiotics. So we, um, I really only found some adult only trials, but there were a couple of trials that looked at kind of comparing a procalcitonin escalation arm versus just like standard of care arm. And so the procalcitonin escalation arm showed actually worsened outcomes without any added benefit. So those patients that just based solely on their procalcitonin, they decided um, to escalate them up to higher level antibiotics, showed worsening outcomes. They had longer stays in the ICU. They required more dialysis, and they did not show any benefit of their treatment. That makes sense. I've never met a pediatric intensivist. I only sent one uh, inflammatory marker on a patient ever. Yeah. So that's good. That, that, I agree. that bears out. <laughs> And then for the last thing for sepsis is um, we looked at de-escalating antibiotics. So what can it tell us about that? Um, And we did find some good adult data to show that there are benefits of procalcitonin antibiotic de-escalation. And those studies didn't show any adverse um, effects. And then there are some pediatric observational studies that agreed, especially in more low-risk patients. But those are patients that clinically we felt like probably did not have bacterial sepsis to begin with. So I don't know that that added a mu- much benefit to what the adult data showed. So the de-escalation is interesting because procalcitonin as opposed to CRP and ESR is sensitive to antibiotic treatment from what I remember. Yes. And so what, what that's saying I think is if the procalcitonin is dropping on treatment, then you can de-escalate therapy yes. or the patient's improving for certain. Yes. That's correct. And so there were a couple of different studies that we looked at. One said, you know, how to drop a certain percentage. Um, and then one they just said, as long as it was trending down, that they felt like it was safe to de-escalate antibiotics in those patients. Well, that sounds great. Okay, good. So we're getting somewhere with sepsis and procalcitonin. But for us, this isn't something we use as often because if a patient is clearly septic, they'll end up in our pediatric intensive care unit. And then we'll get them afterwards when they're when they're better. Right. Yeah, I would say occasionally kids will still come to the floor on broad spectrum antibiotics. So there may be some benefit there um, as far as continuing to trend procalcitonin and then making that decision of when we can deescalate antibiotics to treating, you know, a specific infection, whatever made them septic and then kind of working towards home at some point after that. That's great. Uh, uh, is there more? This is a, this is a great talk. <laughs> So um, the next thing that we looked at, kind of veering away from the infectious part of it, but what else can make your procalcitonin low or high, some other causes of that. So for low procalcitonin, we looked at a couple different things. So kids that are severely or acutely malnourished will not have as high of a procalcitonin or CRP. So those are not not good predictors of bacterial infections in those patients. That's it. So our, our children who are coming in, either failure to thrive or eating disorder anorexia with significant weight loss, if they're coming in ill, we have to know procalcitonin may not be helpful enough for us for them. Absolutely, yeah. I think just having a high clinical um, suspicion for you know for bacterial infections in those kids is very important. Um, the other patient population where you can have a low procalcitonin is in neonates, especially those under 21 days of age. I and mean, it has a pretty low sensitivity of only 44% um, in those kids. It is, like we talked about earlier, the earliest inflammatory marker to increase, but it may still be negative in those febrile infants. So just kind of something to keep in mind. I think that that's a patient population that's getting a full workup if they're febrile anyway. So I don't know clinically that it makes a big difference, but just something to keep in mind. If you do have a low procalcitonin, um, it doesn't mean they're not sick. This is so helpful because this is a tool we most hospitals are now getting. Hospitals, there are some that don't have it as of yet, but I think everyone wants it and is getting it. And now we're really learning more at these conferences, how to use it more effectively. This is wonderful. There are also some causes of high procalcitonin, which would often be things that are stimulating an inflammatory response in the body. So major surgery, um, severe trauma or burns, prolonged cardiogenic shock, perineoplastic syndromes, or acetaminophen toxicity. Generally, these would be something that you are aware that your patient has, or maybe not as common in kids, but just something to keep in mind. If you're sending procalcitonin for an infectious workup, just keep in mind it may be elevated. Similarly to what Sarah said, neonates actually have a peak of procalcitonin at 24 hours of age and have a higher baseline than adults. So in late preterm and term babies, they reach an adult normal by five days, but in the more preterm babies, it can take up to nine weeks to normalize to an adult baseline. So if you're someone working in that preterm population, just know that you're starting from a higher baseline. And again, it can really cloud the picture if you're doing an infectious workup and relying on a procalcitonin level. Um, Another group that has 
um, a higher baseline procalcitonin is people with chronic kidney disease, regardless of whether they're on renal replacement therapy. But it will still elevate with an infection, a bacterial infection, and will decline after the resolution. That's the same as with people with normal kidney function. So that's a case where baseline is important. To exactly. Know. Okay. Um, one thing we talked about that you brought up is that the availability and the speed of this test varies widely by institutions. So knowing what's available where you work and how your team will utilize it is important. Um, so some places it's in-house, it turns around rapidly and is probably sent very frequently. So where we work, it's sent on probably most of our ED patients um, as part of a panel, essentially, if there's any concern for infection and sometimes even if not. Um, but a lot of places, it might be a send out test and not available for hours to days, in which case it might not be as helpful a part of the workup or decision making process. I, I completely agree. It sounds fantastic. Well, this sounds like such a great, I really appreciate you guys coming to give to uh, kind of summarize this talk for those who couldn't make it out here to Florida and, and to get a little of it. And for those like me who were at other sessions because they didn't realize how great this talk was going to be, but I'm super happy you spent time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. So thank you all for coming in. Those of you listening, um, thank you for listening while we're here uh, at the conference. This will be our last uh, PHM National Conference 2022 podcasting session. Uh, it, the conference is done tomorrow. Uh, so thank you all for listening at home and hope everybody is having a great time. And if you're going out today here in, in Orlando, please put sunscreen off. It's very, very hot. You all have a great one.